I'd like to call the August 2nd, 2022 regular meeting of the Gene White Electric Board to uh, For the record, we're a little bit behind. It's 5.54. And so um, first agenda item uh, is the agenda check. Is there anybody that wants to make any cha recommend changes to the agenda? Uh, then uh, items from board members and general manager. I'll start with me. Um, yeah, so I had the um, pleasure of attending two of the upriver listening sessions last few weeks with. Um, hey, and the room's muted, I think. Not muted. Let me let me mute it and unmute it. Test. Hello, can you hear us? I can hear you. I can hear you too. Travis was here. Yeah. Um, anyway, I went to two upriver listening sessions um, with uh, that were led by Adam Spencer, Jeremy Samoji. Hopefully, I pronounced your last name right. Mark Zinniger, um, Frank was at one of them. John Borowski was at one of them. And I think that um, I'll thank you for those of you who helped put them on because I think that you did a really fantastic job. And as a board member, it was. Um, really helpful to get out there and, and talk with people, hear what people's concerns were. People had a lot of questions and both Jeremy and Mark and Adam were able to answer their questions so well. Um, I thought that you guys were so so patient and thorough with people and um, both of, I, I really enjoyed. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. John B. Oh, yeah. Nothing. Uh, just one item. I suspect several commissioners may be paying attention to the city of Eugene's conversations about new Northwest new, new gas going into new buildings. Um, and I'm not proposing that we get involved in any way, but I do. I am, um, I guess, cognizant of the potential for misinformation about eWeb's role or eWeb's e capabilities. And I know. We've been proactive about that in the past, and I'd just like to encourage us as a utility, encourage staff to continue to be proactive if there's if we, if we find that misinformation is produced and, and shared, that we try to do what we can to uh, address that. Thank you. Yep. I've got several items. Um, number one, the work session last week I thought was one of the best things I've done. I mean, the enthusiasm from the leadership and, uh, up there was infectious. I, I really got a lot out of that, and thank you to everybody that participated in that excellent job in my opinion um the few um i'm your opeb uh, the post employment retirement benefits guy and uh the last financial report we got uh, we're down a couple million in the portfolio and initially we had thought and we you know we're going to go through the money part we thought we were just going to make a couple hundred thousand dollar contribution this year in november we'll figure out what it is hopefully the market will be rebound but we took a pretty uh, so uh, that was, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, but um, it just that's what the report said. It's just it's like every other portfolio it's down. And uh, a couple things on the waterfront. You you noticed that, um, and I think the 29th of August, the DEQ is going to have a hearing on Crestwell Foster Farms application to reintroduce a chicken processing plant in Crestwell and dump a lot of chicken five products into a feeder stream into the Coast Fork that the Coast Fork empties right into where we're going to take out our water for a second source. Whether or not eWeb wants to make a comment on that or anything, I just want to bring it up because you know where I stand on water quality. We are, we've got urban runoff, we've got municipalities that have sewage systems, and I just want to make sure that whatever we do, at least from my perspective, I want to do everything I can to protect the integrity of that water. Um, I'm not saying we should object to it. I'm saying that we should be aware of it, or hopefully we can be aware of it and and participate because we're not going to meet again before they have that hearing. And uh, they're they're trying to re re get it running again in Crestwell, and it's a pretty significant impact on the BOD levels, things like that. So, if anybody else wants to chime in on that, that's uh, enough one thing. Um, my second thing on water is uh, you may have saw when we had the. Um, uh, Camp report is a huge camp right above our water intake again on IP property. Um, before I say what I want to say about IP, I just want to acknowledge that the work with EWeb, Lamb Lane, City of Springfield, they've been proactive. 
but uh, yeah, our patrols have reduced that. But we have um, um, have a meeting. I think Frank has one with 20, on 23rd of August to meet with IP and the, the big people there, but <coughs> they've never been proactive. They've always been reactive. And it is as, as again, and we had a, um, we we're doing the cleanups. I think we had one not go that uh, it was $4,000 and on IP property and we paid for it. And so um, I just don't think that if the IP is going to continue to not be good stewards of the river, especially if they own that land right above our intake, that we should pursue that I've, I've been involved in it before about there's a bunch of riparian areas that are floodway. There's no economic things about taking it over because if they're not going to do it, somebody should or at least hold them accountable. I, I know they're a big customer and everything else, but to me that doesn't matter. I don't care how much money they give us or we give them or anything else. I just don't think anybody should continue to allow their property to be used illegally that results in pollution of the waterways. So for the record, just wanted to put that out there. So sorry to be filed, but you know my you know my priorities are. It's clean water. And uh, I just don't want these things to happen to our waterways. So thank you very much. And then Frank. Thank you, President Brown. Um, just a, a couple of things. Um, I did want to thank staff, uh, whether it was part of their normal uh, functional duties or whether it was a volunteer opportunity for those who helped with the World Championships, those who helped with the uh, Jefferson West Side Neighborhood Picnic um, or the Lane County Fair. A lot of opportunities to reach out and, and participate in the community over the last few weeks and, and staffs uh, really stepped up on a number of fronts and so I wanted to to thank the staff for that. Um, the the two water issue, issues, uh, President Brown, there, there's kind of two different things going on there. Um, one is I think that at some point we need to understand our role on the Willamette like we understand our role on the McKinsey. Um, there, there is a process that DEQ is going through. Um, they are the enforcement agent. Um, the application um, for foster farm um, what you know, depending on um, and you know what the track record is and what the enforcement is, um, I'm not in a position to have researched it enough to provide the board a recommendation on on whether and how to act in this particular application. Uh, but it is correct that we do need to, wherever the situation is, understand what occurs up upstream of um, our water source, independent of where that is. So. Um, more, more to come on that, I think, uh, from, from my perspective. The, the meeting on August 23rd with International Paper, I think, gives us an opportunity to um, explore some solutions that would be better long term, whether that's developing some uh, potential agreements on how to handle situate the, the specifics, of whether there's an opportunity to um, explore um, the donation of that particular strip of, of property to someone who can manage it in a different fashion. I think those are both reasonable things to put on the table for, for international reading. So um, appreciate the feedback and gives us some things to do. Thank you very much. And anybody else have any comments? If not, the next agenda item is public input. So I will public input and read the protocols. Uh, for public input, when your name is called, please come to the podium to state your name, uh, your address, or your award. So be, each speaker will be offered three minutes to present your testimony. Please keep track of the time by watching the timer in the front of the room or by audio uh, notification. Three minutes is left. You have, uh, if you're participating by telephone or remember to unmute your call, press star six for the calling the landline or simply use the unmute button for calling the cell phone. Um, and we have anybody on the phone? Okay, good. Um, after each test, will have an opportunity to speak if they choose, although by policy we do not engage in a back and forth. Please note that the failure of commissioner to speak or not be should shall not be construed as support of or opposition to any speaker's testimony. If the request is presented by a speaker, the board does not provide an answer. An EWIP staff member will contact the speaker for the question to um, be addressed at a later time. So we have one person signed up to speak this evening. Uh, Jerry Esther, would you like to post the podium and we'll start the clock. Welcome. Evening. My name is Jerry Astor, 46151 New Pasture Road in Vida. And I've lived on the banks of the McKenzie River uh, since 1996. 
I'm an active community member and I value the quality of life on the rip that the river affords me. Uh, with that in mind, I wish to stress how Leebrook Lake is a distinct and valuable feature within the McKenzie Valley, not only to the community members, but to visitors as well. If Leeberg Dam is removed and the lake is lost, there will be an enormous impact to an area already struggling from the results of the Holiday Farm Fire and economic impacts to tourism, the primary industry in the McKenzie Valley. Lieberg Lake offers local and accessible recreational opportunities. Uh, one, not a day goes by without fishermen, fisherwomen, and fisher children lining the banks or anglers dotting its waters in all manner of watercraft. Uh, in fact, many locals recount stories that the first fish they ever caught was on Lieberg Lake. Kayaking and paddle, paddle boarding are often mastered on Lieberg Lake because of its easy waters and manageable size. From October, from May to October, a group of 25 or more women, who we call ourselves the ladies of the lake, paddle the length of the lake and through the bayou, and then lunch at the visitor kiosk. McKenzie Bible Fellowship and McKenzie Valley Presbyterian churches utilize the shore of the lake for seasonal uh, outdoor church services, and other community groups use the lake for their gatherings as well. The lake lures locals and tourists to the demonstration pond where children of all ages delight in feeding the trout and viewing the giant sturgeon. Lieberg Lake contributes to the local economy of the McKenzie Valley. Situated somewhat halfway between Cedar Flats and McKenzie Bridge, Lieberg Lake serves as a community anchor. Lieberg Store, Ike's Pizza, Vita Community Center, and Everyone's Market are frequented by locals and visitors to the Leeward Lake. As visitors, visitors travel along 126, we are uh, drawn to linger in the area a bit longer due to the presence of Leeward Lake. They can buy fuel at Mather's Market, have breakfast at the Stage Dock or Lucky Lager restaurants, pick up supplies at the Leeward store, and then spend the day on the lake. Once the Discovery Center is operational, the visitor experience to Leeward Lake will be enhanced. Without the presence of the lake, however, the center aims to tell will be greatly diminished. Property values are enhanced by Leeberg Lake. While I do not wish to speak for those whose property properties rim the lake, uh, Leeberg Lake serves as a beautiful focal point for our entire area, and there is definitely a wow factor to suddenly seeing the lake as you walk <laughs> your way along the, the highway. The view is priceless every season of the year. I encourage the board to consider options that preserve Leeberg Lake, and I am personally willing to do whatever I can as a community member to assist in that effort. And I participated in some of the listening sessions and uh, appreciated the opportunity for some back and forth, and I shared some ideas that perhaps will be discussed at another time. Thank you very much. Um, and is Holly, anybody else signed up or? OK, well, then I'll close the public hearing. And Commissioner Feedback. Um, thank you for your testimony, Gary. I want to say that um, one thing that was very apparent in um, came to these listening sessions is that many people stressed about what a uh, different community you are up there. Like it's not a very um, close knit community. There's a lot of different groups. <coughs> But, um, overwhelmingly, people express love for the lake, so that was definitely something that uh, binds you all together. Thank you for your time. Comments? I, I would like to thank you on behalf of the UN board and staff for your testimony, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I know it's a, a, a trek to come down here, so thank you. Um, the next agenda item is the consent calendar A. Uh, is there anybody who wants to remove anything? And if not, I will entertain a motion to adopt. Motion to adopt. Second. Second by Borowski. Discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. <clears throat> Consent calendar B. I Sure. Tell us what items you want to pull. Uh, the item for the bill assistance income verification. Can you and identify which one that is, please? Yeah. Sorry. 
Catholic Community Services. Exactly. Community Catholic Community Services. Okay. And the one for um, Western Utility Telecom. Okay. Just a quick clarifying question. Oh, number three and number seven. Uh, absent those two, I would entertain a motion to adopt the remaining part of the consent calendar B. Move to adopt the remaining. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor, say goodbye and saying aye. 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 McCray, you have the floor. All right. Um, so, number one, which is the Catholic Community Services. Um, I'm just really curious about. Um, so, we're, we're paying $350,000 over the course of five years for Catholic Community Services to verify uh, loans of people who are applying for low um, income assistance on their bills. I understand it. Um, and my question is, uh, one, how many people are we serving currently with assistance on their bills and how many of these are being denied? It's, um, it's we're paying $70,000 a year for this checking service. And I'm just curious the amount of work that's involved in staff to provide um, any background on that. And and I also want to apologize. I, I should have notified staff that I was going to ask about these. So if there's not immediate answers. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll defer some of this to Julie, but I, I would also add that part of this service is the um, is the system that they work within that we would have to go purchase if they did not provide the service. So there's um, income verification that is shared through that service that, that we garner from them. And I'll let Julie, is Julie on or is, oh, yep. Greg's here. I'm here, Frank. Uh, and Greg can verify the numbers. I was going to give you the numbers, but great, thank you. Uh, so how many people do we serve was the question? Yeah, with the low income system, um, exactly, um, the low income bill assistance. And and I'm just curious how many people are applying for that, but not actually we turn out to not be eligible. Question, thank you. Um, we serve approximately 4,200 customers per year through um, this what we call ECC, that's EWA customer care. Um, at the Niles, uh, very few around 30 here. Um, we also use the same system for customers who are doing weatherization through limited income, um, additional incentives for weatherization, and there are approximately 100 customers per year who go through that. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks. It's super helpful to just get a sense of scale of what we're, the, the service provides for us. Thank you very much. Sure. That's all I had on that one. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I had a follow-up question. Uh, two, two questions, quick. On that, so do they provide, they're the sole provider of that service for? We, we currently have two providers. We have Catholic Community Services for all of our customers um, who do not have someone under or over 60 in the hospital. And the remainder are served by the City of Eugene through Campbell Community Center. Those are for anyone who has a member of their household 60 or older. Okay. And then, and then um, we have also tried to save money by deeming customers. So if a customer is eligible for LIHEAP or they're eligible for um, SNAP benefits or some other benefit um, that fits our st the same income qualifications that we use, then we are able to deem them eligible. It gives them faster service and it also saves us money by not having to incur that expense with Catholic or with um, CMAG. And this is a flat amount. Do they, you know, if they have a, a lot more or fewer, <coughs> is it a change or this is just a flat amount of year that they get from providing that service, no matter how many or how few people apply that need verification? Currently paying them a flat amount per income qualification, like $50, I believe. Okay. So we can control how many we refer to them. We control our costs pretty well there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now number seven. Yeah, uh, number seven. Um, the question is about this particular. Um, so this is for um, work on a substation, and one of the issues that's brought up is that this um, this particular um, piece of equipment that we would be installing is more uh, is less unsightly than the lattice structure that is in that location there. 
And my question, and I think I know the answer, is this has to be replaced anyway, right? We're not just making this for cosmetic reasons. We're replacing it, and while we have the opportunity, we're also making the cosmetic upgrade. I'm just clarifying because it wasn't. A the answer is yes. Thank this you. project is is. Uh, I figured that was to rebuild the current substation. I figured that was the case, and forgive me, I was maybe too dense to to read how it was written. That's all I have. Thank Good. you. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adopt items number three and seven on consent calendar B. Uh, moved. Second. Discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. The next agenda item is going to be um, uh, Labor Canal TBL. Lisa, Mark, and Jeremy. Yes, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Lisa Krentz, Generation Manager. Joining you all in person tonight is Mark Zinnaker, our Generation Engineering Supervisor, and Jeremy Samoji, our Labor Strategic Project Manager. In addition to that, we have most of the project team either in the room with you or joining remotely tonight. We'll be providing an update on the decision making process for the long term fate of the Lieberg hydroelectric project. Next slide, please. Shown here is the uh, roadmap of deliverables, ultimately leading to a decision from the board at the end of this year on whether to return the Lieberg Canal to reservice or decommission it. The red line denotes where we're at today and I'm happy to report we're still on track with the next major deliverable, which is a complete draft of the triple bottom line report coming to you in October. Now, given the limited amount of time we have available this evening, we won't be presenting all the information that was provided in tonight's board memo. We will be giving you a brief financial and triple bottom line analysis update and encourage folks to read the board memo for more detail. With that, I'll hand it over to Mark Zinnaker for a financial analysis update. Great. Thank you, Lisa, and good evening, commissioners. Uh, this next slide here is providing you a summary of our baseline capital costs, um, along with their negative 30 to plus 50 percent range. Uh, these are unchanged from the information that you saw at the June 16th workshop. Minor refinements are still expected, but essentially we have a capital cost tie at about 250 million uh, for either pre-project conditions decommissioning for the full return to service and a tie at roughly 180 million in capital costs for the partial return to service and stormwater conveyance options. Next slide, please. As you know, those upfront capital costs are not the whole story. We need to understand the all in costs, so we analyze the net present value. The NPV captures the upfront capital Along with the ongoing cash flows, the O&M expenses, ongoing equipment replacements, power sales revenues for the return to service scenarios, and summarizes those future cash flows in terms of total current dollars. And we bring those future cash flows into current dollars using a discount rate, a percentage rate, as <clears throat> that's defined by UM as our weighted average cost of capital. And note that for our revenues on these NPV analyses, we are using the wholesale market power price. Next slide, please. Um, even those upfront capital costs are not all spent at once. For this type of project, we expect the spend to be spread out over roughly 18 years. The spend is drawn out over the front end due to complex settlement agreement licensing and permitting processes. This spending curve for the return to service looks different than what we showed you at the June workshop. In June, we were thinking that water right preservation issues would motivate uh, urgent progress on the return to service, but have concluded that there just isn't a viable way for us to advance regulatory and relicensing processes any faster than our assumption for the decommissioning process. So the spending rate assumptions are now essentially matching. Next slide, please. And then here are the preliminary net present values. Um, they are uh, better across the board than what we showed you in June, but for different reasons. The decommissioning scenarios are better because we reduced the ongoing O&M cost assumptions for those scenarios. And the return to service scenarios are better because we pushed out the timing of major construction. 
Next slide, please. And this table uh, summarizes the compounded effect of incremental rate increases over the 18 year period 2023 to 2040. Compounded rate impacts range from 11% to 23% and involve borrowing of 238 million to 355 million in order to smooth out the major capital, major lump of capital expenditures. Note that these rate increases are for the labor work only, and which, and um, they are not included in the 83% compounded rate growth. We have expected uh, increases in general rates and incremental increases in BPA rates over during that period. Um, also, want to note that there's lots of best guesses factored into these estimates, but they are indicators of what we would expect in terms of relative impact for each scenario. And then slide eight brings us to the topic of sensitivities. Uh, we have just started our sensitivity analyses and have some preliminary results to share. Uh, we looked at a couple of combination scenarios of high and low capital estimates with high and low power prices. Uh, we've also looked at each variable individually um, along with discount rate and inflation rate sensitivities. Slide nine. And then here are the combination scenarios of high and low capital estimates, high and low power prices. In each case, the alternatives maintain their relative ranking, meaning that you would have to combine a low capital range for one alternative with a high capital range, for example, for another alternative to get a different financial winner. And that is not very likely. Um, next slide, please. When looking at each variable individually, and displaying the results in the tornado diagram, you can see that the capital cost uncertainties have the greatest potential for impact to the NPV results. Power pricing uncertainties have the least potential impact shown at the bottom. And the inflation rate and discount rates are in between. But also that the inflation and discount rates tend to move together, offsetting each other's effect on the NPV analysis. These conclusions apply to other scenarios as well, um, though power pricing, of course, is uh, has zero impact on the decommissioning scenarios. Next slide, please. And then we have some additional sensitivities in progress. We will consider the effect of potentially higher in-stream flow requirements for new or amended license that would drive down the uh, amount of power we can produce. <laughs> We will consider the effects of a sinking fund uh, for the return to service scenario intended to fund either a decommissioning effort or a new relicensing effort at the end of the uh, future license. We will also consider the effect of lower O&M costs if power generation were to cease at both Liebert and Walterville. And we'll consider renewable energy credit values, carbon values and capacity values for the return to service scenarios um, that are not currently reflected in the baseline NPV. Next slide. Um, and the bottom line we do want to identify here is that we have more important financial analysis in progress. So we'd ask the board to withhold judgments on the alternatives at this time. For example, we'll be factoring in the effect of a sinking fund and financing um, for future relicensing or decommissioning of a project that may shift opinions on the return to service options and looking at the situation from the perspective of eWeb's future replacement power needs without Liebert generation may shift opinions on the decommissioning alternatives. Results of these additional analyses are intended to be provided to the board by the next or by the October board meeting. And again, we can't emphasize enough the wide variety of uncertainties that influence the financial analyses. This slide identifies a few more that are difficult to fully investigate via a set sensitivity analysis. There are regulatory uncertainties, general economic cl compliant climate and energy industry uncertainties, climate change uncertainties, and water right uncertainties. Uh, we will also discuss these types of risks in the next round of board correspondence. With that, I'll pass back to Lisa for the triple bottom line discussion. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
I'll now give um, an update on our triple bottom line analysis. Over the last many months, we've been identifying economic, environmental, and social issues to consider in the decision making process. Now, it's important to remember that all alternatives have both benefits and impact in various areas. At the June work session, we presented 25 attributes for further analysis, and I'll show those briefly over the next few slides as a reminder. Next slide, please. Shown here are the preliminary economic issues that we presented to you in June. They range from rate impacts to operations and maintenance costs to value of hydropower, among other things. Next slide, please. And shown here are the preliminary social issues that have, done, have been identified. Note that some of these impacts are more localized to the upriver community, while others have broader impacts to our entire customer base. And we do continue to collect feedback from the community to ensure that we've effectively captured social impacts, and we will continue to update this list as new information is available. And the Lieberg listening um, sessions have been hugely uh, important in allowing us to gather a comprehensive suite of social issues. Next slide, please. And finally, here are the preliminary environmental issues that have been identified, ranging from climate impacts to water quality. Next slide, please. Uh, previous slide, thank you. Again, it's really important to note that all four alternatives have both benefits and impacts in most areas, and that's largely dependent on the stakeholders' perspective and values. Weighing trade-offs is not straightforward due to this, and any option is likely to result in perceived inequity amongst the interested parties. Unfortunately, there's not one single option that will be preferred by all stakeholders. During the board work session on June 16th, we proposed providing a recommendation on triple bottom line issues to focus on based on staff and subject matter expert opinion, as well as public impact put received from our outreach efforts. Now, this approach effectively narrows the list of issues to those with the potential for greatest impact to the broadest customer base and enables the board to focus on the subjects most likely to sway the decision. Tonight, we'll provide our recommendation for three focus attributes in each category based on the results of a recent ranking exercise with subject matter experts. And keep in mind, this is a recommendation only. Next slide, please. From a financial perspective, the issues most likely to impact the broadest customer base are rate impacts, financing and bond impacts, and power price risk reduction. Advance, please, thank you. And from a social standpoint, public safety, local economics, and recreation rose to the top for our subject matter experts. And finally, for environmental, water quality, carbon emissions, and aquatic resources were ranked highest. Now, this isn't to say that we propose to discount the other issues, and we recognize that all issues are important to many stakeholders and to EWEB. We will continue to collect feedback to ensure we're accurately capturing the impacts, and ultimately, we intend to provide um, and identify potential mitigative actions to reduce the effects of various impacts. Now, the next step is for the board to give their feedback on the list of most impactful issues, and we've developed a tool to assist you with that. Next slide, please. So shortly after this meeting, staff will provide the board with an Excel formatted tool that will allow you to weight the attributes according to your perspective and see how modifications to weighting influences the selection of an alternative. Each board member may come to a different conclusion on appropriate weighting. For example, some board members might feel that their top issue carries a lot more weight than the next issue, while another board member might feel that their top three are equally important and should be weighted evenly. Again, our recommended focus issues are those that are most likely to have impacts on our entire customer base, as opposed to localized and individual impacts. However, each board member may have a different perspective. Next slide, please. That's the end of tonight's formal presentation. We'll be coming back to the board in October with a complete draft triple bottom line report, followed by a multi-hour work session later that month. And now we'll open it up to questions and comments. Thank you, Lisa. Um, okay, we've got about 16 minutes left. There's five of us, do the math. Who would like to go first? Matt, quick clarification, the time frame for the net present value 
calculation? Was it to 2070 or 2040? So, yeah, it was actually out to uh, 2075. 2076. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'll jump in real quick. To, I, I had technical problems. As I, I submitted some questions. I never did see the oh, okay. answers. And so, um, it, your projections on the Cougar Flow reg, Regimen historically or now? I mean, if they're not going to impound the water, we're probably not going to be having the flow in the summer that we used to have. And so, we're not going to be able to generate the. What did you use? We used the indicators that they've given for, the, for the future operations. Okay, and then the license status, when you say uh, sinking fund to recapture, we're not going to recapture the lost the, uh, right. license halfway into Lieber right now. And so do, are we going to get a 20 year license or a 40 year license when we do this? We would, we would seek a 40 year license. Okay, so we're going to start over. And so all these costs also include what they're going to require us to do to to Walterville as well, because it's in the it's in the license. That's true. So we have budgeted for the relicensing effort, the uh, and the impacts on Lieber. Just on Lieber. Right. We so but if we open it up, don't they get the, a, a, another bite at the apple for Walterville? They like they would. They do. Could it I'll just chime in real quick on that. Commissioner Brown, you're absolutely correct because Lieber and Walter are licensed together under one FERC license. Walterville does need to be considered. We have kept this analysis focused on Lieber at this point. However, we do recognize that there um, that ultimately if particularly if a decommissioning scenario is chosen, we will need to consider um, what that means for Walterville as well, like, likewise for the return to service scenario. So we envision doing a similar analysis on Walterville following a decision on Lieber. So in closing, these costs could be significantly higher than what we're looking at because we're just looking at Lieber. Uh, they, if Burke turns around and says, you could do the same thing to Walterville. Are you, I mean, last time when we did it, we didn't have any of these issues. It was 150 million, 140 million. Let's do. And so I'm just doing the math. Yeah. If we don't have any seismic issues, just to redo Walterville could be another 50 to 70 million. And we have a, yeah, a separate set of studies underway to look at all of some of the same questions that we're trying to answer from Lieber okay. or Walterville as the next step. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm done. Others? Yeah, I, uh, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, I guess kind of my questions were going to the licensing. So we're going to license the for return to service, the $238 million would get us return to service. Nine megawatts of power at Lieberg and a license through 2076. Right, from there. And okay, so that uh, just one correction. Correction, I think it's six megawatts for this partial return to service. Nine megawatts for the average megawatts. Yeah. Added. Yeah, return full full return to service. Back to where where it started was 238. The other one was 186 or something like that. Thank you. And Commissioner Borowski, we are making some assumptions on what we would be able to what license term we would be able to get. It's all again part of a negotiated process with stakeholders and regulatory agencies, and so none of that is certain. So there's a fair amount of uncertainty associated with. Uh, what we would ultimately end up with with a new license. So I just want to make sure that that is not forgotten. No, no, no. I heard uncertainties mentioned about 19 times in the presentation. Yes. And that makes me very confident in a wise and certain decision on this. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be very challenging. So I look forward to getting more of the information that you asked us to hold off on our decisions until we have those, or our opinions until we have those decisions. But um, thank you. Minnie or Sonia? Um, thank you. I look forward to getting more uh, information as well. And if anybody's familiar with the show Cutthroat Kitchen, where there's always like a little twist, <laughs> I feel like that's what happens. <laughs> and
every time we get a pre presentation on this, um, it just gets more and more complicated or I, I always expect there's going to be more clarity at each iteration and it just seems to like there's there's always like some other twist. So anyway, hopefully it will get clearer or at least the options will um, present themselves a little differently. Okay. Echo that with the uh, coupling of Walterville and Beecher. That, that, so that's a that's a huge issue <laughs> that's been overlooked. Um, so I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, the only other thing that I was curious about, you said that there were the two uh, pieces, the inflationary side and the discount rate, they were conversely um, kind of situated. But it seems like in the short term they're not. I mean, we're seeing we're seeing rates actually increase. At the same time as inflation is increasing in the short term, so I guess the expectation over time that those will adjust down and that this is a long enough time frame that that will balance itself because it's over. The idea is that the, the inflation yeah. increases those future costs, but that we're discounting them back at a higher rate as well, um, which somewhat offsets the that sort of thing. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Then. okay. Matt, you have another follow-up? Uh, yeah, so first, uh, thank you for the TBL analysis. It, it's helpful to have kind of a, a full comprehensive picture of the things that we should all be considering here. Also, thank you for the economic analysis that every time that I, I learn more things. So I, I appreciate the way this is done, the way it's presented. Um, the, the, the link to Walter, Walterville is um, super interesting to me in terms of how we make our decision as a board. And um, I know your this crew has already got a full plate and then some. Um, and I wonder if if we could get some kind of sense of what information might be available to us during our discussion in October about how we might consider Walterville as we're thinking about Lee Bird. Like, I, you know how how interconnected are they? If we decide one, are we automatically deciding the other? Um, I, I know it's uncertain, um, but I guess kind of some guidance as to the level of uncertainty, a level of clarity. Um, if we can just have some kind of sense of what information we might, you'll have available to us in October, that would be helpful. We can work on um, explaining some of the implications of. A leaper decision on Walterville. That'd be super helpful. Yeah. John B, and then I have a quick one too. Go ahead first. Well, I just so I want to make sure that we throw another 200, 250 million in debt on this with no revenue to offset it. Does that change our debt covenants, our, our, you know, our debt coverage ratios, and we're not able to maybe make them and we lose our bond rating? Is, is that a, a real possibility? That was one of the economic impact factors that we identified and maybe Deborah you can chime in on that. So anytime we borrow money in so our debt service coverage, um, right. we have talked with our financial advisors at Piper Jaffrey about any concerns they have about borrowing on a non revenue generating property. And I think we are OK there. The debt service coverage, though, will be um, it's something that we're going to have to keep our eye on for sure. So it looks like Frank would like to comment. President Brown, um, part of the, the rate impact is driven by our requirements to maintain our debt service coverage. So when you see a rate impact, some of that is driven for a number of reasons. You have to create the revenue to, to create the debt service coverage you need to execute the project. So uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, we're going to keep our rating, and to do that, we have to be willing to raise rates to do this. Thank you. John B. Yeah, so that kind of goes back. I, I'm looking at the slide that shows the compounded rates and incremental funding. Um, so on return to service number two and alternative number three, we're looking at 21% or 11%. That's over 17 years, not over the total relicensing. Right. Okay. But the debt would be longer than 17 years, correct? So I guess that's what that's what I'm not clear on. 21% would be a 1.2% year uh, 
made an increase per year. Um, but if, if that's going out. And then the other thing I heard you say, although I didn't see it in the text, was that you anticipated our rate increases would be 83% without this over that same 17 years. Right. So, so we're going from 83% to 101% increase over 17 years if we do return to service two or 94% increase if we're talking the other one. I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in. So the those are compounded. Mm -hmm. So if you take that 83% and you were to look to divide it over that number of years, it, it averages about three and a half percent per year. 83% does. 83%. Does. And that's, that's based on our normal capital projections. We're trying to be somewhere in that 3% range. So that's where the 83% comes. So from. each one of these would add a percent between, yes, between yes. three quarters and 1%. One and a half. Those, those would add on top of that. And um, the reason that it doesn't cover the full 70 year period is that um, you need to start recovering that earlier. And once that's added into your rate base, it stays there. It's not like it, it falls off. So that whatever that accumulated compounded, it, it remains over the life of whatever you're financing, which could be 25, 30, 35 years. Uh, another piece of information that would be helpful for, for me is industry wide what you what people think the rates increases will be. I mean, if if we're if we're on the low end of what regionally wise rate increases are going to be, that may help me make a decision to go to a higher cost one. If if you know if rates regionally are going up five percent over that time, and we're looking at three point or whatever, that would be helpful too. We'll get you a specific answer to that. Um, the, the impression is that um, based on our principles and trying to make sure our rates are in line with inflation, I would be surprised if that's out of line with, with other utilities. Um, what is different is when you pack on top of that things like this project, which is something that a cost that has been um, incurring over a number of decades that we're now having to to pay for. So that would be an incremental uh, up and above um, what we're seeing from Bonneville, which is included in that that um, 83% as well as a sort of a normal escalation on on top of capital. So that first part's probably fairly normal. It's the the packing of extra baggage on top of that that is is going to be unusual for us. And the final thing is second source considered into that three and a half percent rate increase. No, that's um, uh, this is only the electric. Um, so the the water side is um, a, a different calculation that was included in the long term financial plan that we visited. Um, Thank you, President Brown. I just I just wanted to mention one thing since it came up uh, specifically around Walterville. What I think we can do is differentiate between which Walterville issues will um, create differences between the, the alternatives. There might be some Walterville issues that are there independent of, of which alternative is selected. And then where it matters, we can highlight uh, how and where it would matter between sort of alternative one versus alternative three, or just, just to highlight what those issues are. Um, and when everybody's done, I do have a question for the board that, that I'd like to get some feedback on. I think we're as long as staff has. Do you have what you need from us? No. Good. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to see if we could get a little bit of clarity on is that um, we have the objective to work with you and understand as much as we can about the impacts to the community and and um, our customers. Um, at some point uh, this year, I wanted to find out from the board whether you're looking from management for an assessment um, without a recommendation or whether what we ultimately bring, bring back to you is a recommended is a recommended course of action going forward. Is this you want an assessment and you can decide or do you want management <laughs> looking you after going through all this after hearing you? 
working with you on this, working with the community, this is the course of action that we would recommend. Do you want a recommendation or an assessment? I guess that's my question. I want to go first. Assessment. I'm, I'm fine if you just bring us the information. It's such a big decision. We have to do a lot to vet that with the public. And, yes. and so I'm happy to have you give us as many details as possible about the pros and cons of each option, and then we can make a But others may have a different view. I'd like to add some uncertainty and tell you I'd like to give you that answer next week when we meet because I got to stew on the implications of that question. I'd like an assessment and a recommendation. I mean, uh, we're lay people. We, we kind of, to me, we were supposed to reflect community values, but I don't know anything about the technical stuff per se. You guys do, you, this, you and your staff. And just because you give us a recommendation doesn't mean we have to follow. And so we still get, I mean, we're not afraid to. I think this board has got enough I agree. behind us to where if you say do alternative one, we say, no, we want three, we'll do it. But I, I don't want to foreclose having a recommendation from a group of what I think are highly trained experts to give us, because this is a, this is the biggest decision I'll ever make. And this board, I think, will ever make. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, we're strapped in the future with what, past is done and there's no revenue from it. So I think it's very important. So I would like a recommendation. That doesn't mean we're going to buy it, but I would still like to see what you think about what your option is. I would also like a recommendation. I'm just, I think that, um, I don't know if there's just going to be like, as a group, you give one recommendation, but I'm really curious of how all of you think about this. I mean, you're the ones who are really delving into the details and we can ask our questions. Um, so maybe a with nuance too, because you might not all think the same thing. I don't know if you're allowed to differ from each other. When you hear our but are we allowed to differ from each other? That's, that's so, real. I mean, it, it really helps me to hear how you all think about it as well, because your perspective is so different than ours. That would be, that would be, confident thinking about making a decision. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of in alignment with Mr. Brown. Although I think a recommendation and kind of getting to Mindy's thing, perhaps ranking a little bit, maybe. This is our this is our top tier recommendation. This would be our second tier recommendation, which might be helpful, uh, especially if they're close. Um, and then the other thing that probably should be considered that if you're giving a recommendation, that uh, general manager should have to uh, be an elected official, <laughs> <laughs> so that that decision can be. Uh, recalled at the ballot box. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I you know. I only think think it takes three votes to recall me. <laughs> no, so, um, but no. I think I think a record. I think the the hybrid approach goes well. I think we are like like John said. I think that I've got a feeling that I may come down different than what staff's recommendation is, and. I have seen in the past elected officials come down opposite of staff recommendations on numerous occasions. Most times it doesn't work out very well, <laughs> but uh, I, I may be willing to, to go that route if if that's what I feel my conscience says. So thank you. Yeah, Frank? I think so. Um, you, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that there are a lot of nuances to this. We're, we're asking for a direction, you know, going forward. Um, there will be nuances to it, that, and we want to help educate the board as to what those are, what, what mitigation can take place, uh, because we we do understand that this is this is a complicated issue. There there is expertise that this will trigger internal debates, by the way, which is really healthy to have. Um, 
it's healthy to have because it allows you to explore the differences, I think is, is what you were, you were calling those, um, which are very reflective of, of differences within the community as well. So um, I think what we'll do is, is we'll position this that uh, based on discussions and feedback from the board, based on uh, information from the community, as well as internal analysis that um, we can uh, provide some guidance and some recommendations to the board, fully knowing that you're the board making the decisions ultimately on this direction. And we, we want to uh, ensure that you have what you need. If, if we don't bring you a recommendation or the information to support that recommendation, then you should send us back uh, to do some more work. So that's that's another alternative. You don't have to agree or disagree. You can say we need some more information to do this. So. We're going to go into that with our eyes wide open. But I appreciate the feedback. So saying better late than wrong. So thank you. Uh, Sonia? If that was the dissenting opinion. I just wanted to clarify that I very much appreciate all the staff's opinion. It was more to the point that it's going to be such a monumental issue that it's really on us. But And I'm fine with a recommendation coming back. That's absolutely fine, and I value the opinion there. Uh, but ultimately, it will be on us um, to make that and it does seem like it's going to be a doozy. So I appreciate all of you going through that uh, process too to bring us a sort of recommendation. I also feel like if you've done the work in bringing us the, con the pros and cons to the extent that I trust that you will, that the recommendation will fall. I could be wrong, but um, that's usually what I walk away with from the presentations that you provide. So that was my thank you. So, so good. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item number eight, IRP resource profiles and performance. Megan, Van and Aaron. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Megan Kempner. I'm here with Ben Ulrich. We have Aaron Bush on the phone. If you have any questions later. Um, as you'll recall, uh, we are here to talk about goal number five, which is uh, to deliver a public draft of the integrated resource plan in December. We come to you and talked about com uh, consumption characteristics earlier in the year. We had some small group discussions, and last week we provide uh, we uh, played a portfolio game. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, different types of resources and their characteristics. And then in November, we're going to uh, have a work session and put uh, everything together and come with some portfolio options that we can discuss. And then in December, we'll be providing that public draft. So I'm going to hand it over to Ben to talk about resource characteristics. Great. Thanks, Megan. So tonight, we're here to talk about those new resource options that you have might consider as part of our future portfolio and the characteristics of those candidate resources. As we've said, there's no perfect, low cost, low carbon, highly flexible resource option out there, but instead we're evaluating a mix of resources as a hypothetical portfolio. Tonight, we're going to talk about the characteristics of these resources individually. Bear in mind that we're only discussing hypothetical new resource options and not specific generators or power purchase contracts. We worked in collaborations with the consultants at E3, a leading energy consulting firm, to develop a list of candidate resources that are commercially operational today or likely to be operational within the next 10 years. In the board backgrounder, we provided uh, in the appendix a new re the new resource options under consideration, E energy cost and carbon attributes of each resource type. This is much too small to read on the slide, it's just for reference. Um, in the table showing key performance characteristics, we focused on direct or just uh, scope one carbon emissions associated with the generation of electricity. Some may want to consider total life cycle emissions, but these upstream and downstream carbon emissions are not associated or not are outside the scope of this IRP. 
Although we didn't include those as explicit attributes in the appendix, we know that the board may want to consider other environmental factors like the impacts on fish and wildlife or social justice considerations in future decision making. We believe that as the IRP focuses our strategy in the years ahead, there'll be an opportunity to begin considering additional criteria as the IRP helps us narrow in on those best fit resources. In addition, UWeb's triple bottom line decision making framework be applied during the research procurement process to make sure that our energy supply matches our community values. As we look to build a future resource portfolio, we're trying to meet eWeb's needs at the least cost. So we wanted to be sure to break down two key cost performance metrics that were included in that attribute table. Levelized cost of energy simply divides the lifetime cost of a resource by the lifetime power generation. This cost metric includes capital investment, financing costs, taxes, and operating and maintenance costs associated with the resource. Levelized cost of energy does not include decommissioning costs or transmission costs. This metric is helpful for considering comparing resources, but it's highly dependent on the assumed power generation. It also ignores the seasonality and timing of energy production, which for eWeb as a winter peaking utility, the ability of a resource to generate during our 8 a.m. morning winter peaks is really important. The second metric tries to consider a resource's value in a way that levelized costs might ignore. The cost of peak capacity contribution looks at the cost of building a resource divided by the peak capacity contribution that that resource provides. This metric changes by season and considers how a resource could be used to contribute towards grid reliability. We thought that looking at both these metrics is a helpful way for the board to consider the potential value of resources and how some may be ideally suited to meet energy or capacity needs or some combination of the two. So let's dive into those future candidate resource options. EPA is eWeb's largest provider of energy and capacity today. They provide service, services to eWeb through two distinct products, Block and Slice. Block product provides a fixed quantity of power for every hour within a given month. With the Slice product, eWeb receives a fraction of what the BPA system produces and has flexibility over when that power is generated and delivered. Today, we use Slice to ramp up and down to meet changes in our daily demand. Slice is a flexible product but does vary based on the water year that we're having and requires staff to manage that flexibility. The chart to the right illustrates how the two products work together on a typical winter day with the block in blue remaining fixed over that 24 hour period and the slice changing up and down each hour based on our demand. Our existing contract with BPA expires in 2020 and there are concerns that BPA's ability to provide power to eWeb in the future will be limited due to fish, fish passage and other environmental litigation. As, as a conservative assumption, this IRP is assuming that BPA will not be able to provide more power to eWeb in the future as our loads grow. For a reference case, we are modeling the block and slice products as they are today after adjusting for rate increases and inflation. However, we believe that the 2024 IRP will need to do a much deeper dive on the BPA product offerings as negotiations begin to provide us more clarity around those future BPA product choices. Moving on to wind, so we partnered with E3 to estimate the costs and energy profiles of new generation technology. And for wind, E3 created hourly energy profiles for future wind projects based on a sampling of five different states and five subregions of Oregon using data from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL. As you can see on the table to the left, the annual capacity factors vary by reason, by region, excuse me. The higher the capacity factor, more energy that a wind farm could produce. Utility scale wind farms provide low levelized cost of energy and do provide some winter capacity or some summer capacity depending on the location of the wind farm. You'll see that we did include offshore wind on our list of candidate resources, but it should be noted that it costs nearly three times as much as onshore wind. In the near term, the cost of wind has increased due to inflation and supply chain issues. But E3's cost projections show that in the long term, the cost of wind is still expected to decline slowly over the study period. The biggest risk of wind energy is the need to develop new transmission. Because the best sites for wind are far from eWeb loads, we're assuming that the true cost of energy will be increased due to transmission costs. We'll be adding in estimated transmission costs to each of these locations to account for this. Solar also, also has geographic diversity, but maybe less so than wind. 
In our analysis, the biggest difference is assuming solar production either coming from east of the Cascades or located here in Eugene. Utility scale solar energy can be produced at low cost, but solar's peak capacity contribution in the winter is very low. In addition, utility scale solar also has transmission cost risk associated, just like wind, because the ideal siting is often far away from Eugene. In addition to modeling utility scale solar in multiple locations, staff have included community and residential solar in Eugene as a candidate resource. Overall, community solar projects are estimated to cost double compared to utility scale solar, and residential rooftop solar is estimated to cost anywhere between four to 10 times as much as utility scale. The primary difference for this is due to the lower capacity factor in Eugene, which you can see in that chart at the bottom of the slide. Uh, community and residential solar do not have the transmission costs associated with utility scale solar, and community solar programs do offer opportunities to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion in the program offerings, which can make those projects appealing. However, it should be noted that community solar programs would require some investments in our billing systems to implement. So let's talk about batteries. <clears throat> Utility scale batteries are starting to appear in regional IRPs as a way to integrate the anticipated build of renewable, renewable resources. Lithium ion battery costs have declined dramatically in the last decade and are expected to continue to decline another 30% in the next 10 years. In addition, batteries can be placed within eWeb service territory, which reduces transmission risk. In the chart at the bottom of the slide, you can see an example of how solar energy production can be complemented with a battery to meet the evening demands in California. This example can illustrate how a solar plus battery solution could meet summer peaks. However, our reliability challenges in the Northwest are different than California because most utilities west of the Cascades are winter peaking. eWeb's new resource options include a four hour lithium ion battery, which means that the resource's ability to meet those peak events is four hours. This isn't always sufficient to meet those multi-day cold fronts that can drive our winter peaks. Unfortunately, longer duration storage lacks market availability and remains much more expensive than four hour storage. Even with limited, the limited capacity contribution in the Northwest, batteries are still one of the lowest capacity only resource types that we have modeled among the candidate resources. Right, lowest cost, excuse me. Let's talk about thermal generation. Natural gas generators are commonly used in the electricity sector because they have relatively low upfront costs provide base load capacity, and have the flexibility to meet our peak loads, including those multi-day cold fronts. All thermal generation has some fuel cost risk. Natural gas generators today still use mostly fossil fuels and are subject to gas supply risks, which is front of mind this year with the war in Ukraine putting pressure on domestic gas supply. Both Oregon and Washington have legislation which prohibits or discourages the building of new natural gas generation, which makes development risk for those projects high. Despite these challenges, E3 and other energy thought leaders have found that natural gas plants play an important role in maintaining grid reliability as more, as more renewable energy is added to the grid. These plants have the potential to remain idle more often and could be used as peaking only resources. There are two types of uh, natural gas generators that we've modeled, simple cycle and combined cycle. Simple cycle turbines are less efficient are less efficient, but have lower capital costs and more flexibility, whereas combined cycle are more efficient, but are a little bit less flexible and can take longer to come online. Biomass and cogeneration thermal generators are very site specific, and evaluation of those hypothetical candidate resources can be nuanced. The fuel mix can be waste products like woody biomass or a combination of waste byproducts and natural gas. The emissions level of those cogenerators be a subject of debate depending on the methodology of carbon accounting and the unit's contribution towards local air pollution. Typically, those generators have qualified for renewable energy credits as part of Oregon RPS laws. Overall, these plants could operate in a similar way, similar way to natural gas generators, but there are often other operational considerations other than just the production of electricity for those resources. We've also included small modular nuclear reactors as a candidate resource in this IRP. These modern facilities have a much smaller footprint and passive safety technology defined, designed to be a fail safe in the event of an emergency. Included SMRs in our modeling work as a good proxy for firm generation that's also carbon free. If carbon policies continue to become more stringent, stringent there'll be a point at which those 
uh, more expensive emerging clean technologies become financially viable. So for demand response programs, they're similar to battery, batteries in that they can provide important peaking capacity, but have a limited duration. They can also help defer investments in transmission and distribution infrastructure. We've compiled a list of likely, likely DR programs that you have might consider it in the future. All demand response programs offer financial incentives to customers to change their electricity consumption. I've categorized them into pricing programs or event-based programs. Pricing programs give customers a price signal and use rates to influence behavior. These, these programs don't require formal signups and have lower cost to implement. You can exclude the cost of advanced metering and billing systems that you need to have in place. Event-based programs use software to allow the utility to lower energy use within the community during specific hours of the day. These programs typically are only dispatched four to six times per season for just a few hours and often require the utility to offer incentives to get customers to sign up. There's only a limited amount of demand response potential in our community. These programs can be costly. Our modeling shows that demand response is part of our lease cost portfolio. Uh, we would want to consider doing a demand response potential assessment study to better understand the quantity of energy that could be shifted and refine these cost estimates. Conservation is the last resource we're going to be discussing tonight. In the last IRP, the board prioritized energy efficiency as the preferred resource to meet our organic load growth. For the IRP, we're modeling conservation potential in six different cost bins for both residential and commercial. This method will allow us to determine the tipping point at which energy efficiency is no longer the least cost solution to meet our needs. There are some small amounts of very low cost energy efficiency, but historically programs in the more expensive levelized cost bins have been implemented due to their peak savings potential. For example, conservation programs geared towards ductless heat pumps can help replace inefficient electric heating, which contributes to our peaks today. If conservation is part of our least cost strategy, a conservation potential assessment would help us better estimate the amounts of conservation still available in our community and refine these cost estimates as well. So with that, we can open up for discussion. Uh, we provided some key metrics from the appendix for reference on the slide if the board finds that useful for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we just took a drink out of a fire hydrant. That's a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you. Um, questions, comments? Sure, I'll start. Thank you for the presentation. That was a lot, but I thought you were pretty clear and boiled things down to the bare essentials. Thank you also for the memo because this is super clear and to have all the detail. So uh, well communicated, much appreciated. Um, I really only have two thoughts at this point. Um, yes, I think a conservation uh, potential assessment would be very valuable. I was reading through this and saw that our current estimates are based on some um, regional estimates, which I think is useful, but for our purposes of planning energy, I feel like the you know, more concrete, more localized study would be valuable. And then the same with the command response potential. It feels like, from my perspective, we need to have as, as granular a data as we possibly can in our IRP. So that's my opinion. That's all I got. Questions, comments? Mindy? Well, I agree with Matt. That's what I was going to say is to me, it seems obvious that we should really look into the demand response and the conservation and try to max those out. Um, especially given the, the information that you've presented and this board has set a target of having 95, I think it's 95% carbon free um, electricity. So yes, yeah, so my my question is when you come back to us, like how do we do that <laughs> based on all the you know stipulations and fatal flaws kind of in every every category that you've given, how how do we make that happen? I know you're gonna be asking us to give input, but that's my question back to you. Like what does that what does that look like? So your question is about the ninety five percent carbon free and how do we make it happen? It's yeah. going to be um it, it's it's in the program. It's it's we're only going to bring you portfolios that meet the ninety five percent. It's kind of like the game we play. That's going to yeah. be the criteria, and we will not bring you anything that doesn't meet that that criteria. Frank, 
I just wanted to, to clarify one thing just just um, for the board is that when we turn this crank, uh, there's going to be uh, requirements to that, such as the 95%, and we'll take a look and um, bring a number of portfolios back to the board, and those portfolios will have different characteristics. In some cases, um, those may lead to a certain degree of demand response, for example, um, or conservation, as another example. Um, what's what's going to be interesting is when we get those back, there might it conservation might be one of those things that boils to the top and says um, conservation um, below fifty dollars is definitely part of this portfolio. We need to pursue it. That's where another step would be. Well, how what what's the total potential for that fifty dollars? So some of this informs the IRP and some of it comes as a result of the IRP. The IRP sort of puts this big stew together and um, if you have to go investigate, you know, the kind of vegetables a little bit further, that's that's maybe a next step. So not all of this goes into the first. Some of this comes out and says, oh, and I'll use conservation as an example. We need to achieve so much conservation and meet all these needs. Um, and, and that's the portfolio that, that will be preferred. We then have to go figure out what's the potential for that $50 conservation and how do we how do we achieve that? So it is a little bit iterative, um, but it's one of those things where there'll probably be multiple portfolios that, that meet the criteria. And that's where we can talk to the board about what's the commonality between those. Those are sort of low hanging fruit that we should be doing no matter what that goes into the action plan. And then some of the other ones are what are the differences and how do we tease out the differences further? I was going to jump in if I could. I just have a couple of questions and sorry, I don't maybe understand it. So when we talk about transmission and things like nuclear, you know, these things don't exist. New transmission lines and nuclear plants don't exist, and they take 10 to 20 years to prepare. Why are we considering them as resources? You know? Well, first of all, when this transmission is so, is so site specific right. that when we get to a point, um, if, it, if it, our gaps are being filled with, let's say, we see that a small module in nuclear is the right lowest cost resource to fill a gap then we will go out and then we will look at what are the options and where are they and then we can see if we have transmission existing transmission capability to bring it home um so and i'm thinking about the time frame if if it if to permit a nuclear facility is 10 to 20 years or whatever it may be um and that this is a 10-year plan um, i'm just thinking about the logistics if we're considering a resource that doesn't exist and we're going to use it to fill a gap, but the probability of it existing probably is slim and does they given, I mean, what's it take 17 years to build that last transmission line is still not permitted? No, I, I completely guess. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it takes a long time to build transmission. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, all of the resources that are identified here are going to be available within the planning window. Small nuclear and small modular reactors. Uh, the the present projects um, are looking at early 2030s. So um, we aren't looking at. Some studies will look at sort of mystery resources. We're not we're not concerned with that. The the issue with transmission, I'll say near term versus long term. Near term, there there is scarcity in the transmission system. Near term is probably a cost issue. Long term is probably a, a build issue. So uh, depending on the resources that are selected, we'll have to identify the risk associated with that. And it could be either a cost risk or it could even be an access risk, which would be more of a longer term. Thank you. We have a couple other to hear from. Sonia? I so just wanted to say that I'm very sorry that I was not able to be here last week. I'm in my vacation in January. So I'll look forward to watching the video and seeing what I can clean from that. It's not going to be as hands on, but I'll get what I can out of it. Sounds like it was a really good event. Thank you for all your work on this. I, I also think it's very clear. Maybe. Yeah, so I, I guess. I need some clarity as to what. My role as a commissioner is going to be in this um, because. 
The exercise we went through the other day was great. But I feel that that is something that staff is going to be doing and bringing us back these recommendations. I think that you know we've kind of already set some sideboards when we said we want 95% carbon free portfolio. I mean, I mean, I guess the question I have is what more sideboards are you going to want from us? And are we, am, am I particularly the best person to give those answers or are the people that deal with this on the rate on a daily basis, the better ones to do that? I mean, I, I can give some feeling that, yeah, I want to go this way or that way, but when we were putting our things in the, in the work session, you know, we threw them out there in that first round, we were sky high off the board. And then, you know, we narrowed it down and narrowed it down. I don't feel that I will even even with uh, the games that we played and all these backgrounders that I'm going to be able to be able to make that the best decision. Better than the people that are sitting up there. So I guess my question is, is what are you going to be looking for from us? Specifically, are you going to say I want no natural gas. I mean, where? What am I going to be giving you guys when it comes out? I think I think it's a really good question. Um, let, let me take a couple examples. When when we come to you in in November in the work session, let's say we have ten different portfolios and they meet all of the criteria already, and we have one portfolio that may say we need um, our least cost resource, and we we have a twenty five megawatt gap in four years, and, um, and that's energy efficiency. Another one may say, hey, you, you, you can put a little gas in there in, in, in start, you know, in three years. And, and you're going to look at those and you're going to and you're, and you're going to say, OK, what are the common themes between between all of the portfolios? Wow, it seems like we may need to be prepared. Um, do we want to be prepared for gas or do we want to make a statement about that? Do we want to be prepared for storage? Because that's the, the least cost. I don't know. I, I don't know what it's going to come out. But let's just say it says you need least cost is going to be energy efficiency. Well, then we'll say what is the what are the bins that are the least um, uh, the least expensive? And so, what it, what as a board, you would look at what are the themes that you're seeing, and what are some actions that we might take. And you might say, I don't think there's enough information about energy efficiency. So why don't you guys go out and do a study? So that would be an action item that we might have is to do this kind of conservation potential, uh, and that so so we would do that, and then. Um, we would have uh, you would give us direction on how you would want us to do it, and then in the uh, 20 um, IRP in 2024, then we come back and we report out to you how how did it go, what did we do, and then what are we doing as a result of it, and we'd incorporate that in the next IRP. So it's a uh, um, it's around uh, about it's about helping you guys deciding what direction you want us to go in. Let's say you guys um, as a result of the portfolios, you want to research more batteries. You're like, wow, batteries kept coming up in here. So you might give us a, we, you, you can give us direction as, um, to staff to go out and do an RFI to collect information to find out what it costs and what, what, what most viable. Um, or you can have us do uh, just do some research and come back. It's really what you're the theme that you find. I, I think that was a, a great response. I'll, I'll be a, um, a little bit more direct with, with the question because I think it's a really good one. Because I just asked when the I did the last issue, I asked the board uh, what you were looking for us on, on Lieber. Uh, turnaround is, is fair, Commissioner <laughs> Borowski. Um, we're not going to come to the board and ask your approval on an IRP plan. That's that's not the intent. What we are going to look for is that there's potentially multiple multiple pathways up this mountain, and from representing the public perspective. What guidance can can you provide to us on these the trade offs between these these paths? Um, that's what we're going to be looking for. There, we, we could come up with a scenario um, that was super cheap and it was all hydro and natural gas. Well, um, and it maybe it accomplishes all those things. And there's another option that might be a combination of three or four things. There's going to be pros and cons to risks. 
there might be some things that are common across those and we all sort of look at each other and go, gosh, it really makes sense to, to create an action plan because that's really workable in all the portfolios. So it's really um, a guidance. Um, really good. We're going to look for guidance. We're also um, based on our approach to this. A lot of organizations actually create committees with the public on IRPs. Our approach is to work with you and then go out for a public comment period to see to see what people think of it. We actually have the opportunity to do that because we don't have a major resource decision uh, in the next couple years. Uh, the most urgent one is probably what products uh, and what electives we take from Bonneville that we can't model in this because we don't know what that is yet. Um, if we will probably know within the next year or two. So that's kind of another another step, but this is really about guidance for us. And one last thing on the. On the energy options. I didn't see. Else put in there at all. Uh, we're talking about doing a hydrogen. Project right next door. Is there some reason that hydrogen isn't going to be an option within the next 10 years? We haven't modeled it as an explicit resource, but when I said like the, the small modular reactor was a good example of kind of clean emerging tech, uh, that's a good proxy resource. And so that's an example of where our modeling kind of picks that and something that I could see hydrogen kind of fitting in that clean, clean firm generation category that's still kind of emerging. And that could also lead into storage as well. I mean, a battery has four hour storage, but we've got a 100,000 cubic feet of hydrogen stored in a pipe. That could be a lot more than four hours of stored energy. I think that's a really good example of you know, valuable feedback right, right now, because I would see hydrogen as something we should probably model generically in the in the storage category as opposed to the SMR category, and that will be within the 10 year window. Um, there, there's a number of different hydrogen projects and um, um, you know, work going on across the West for that. So that's something that we will add into the, to the model from a storage perspective. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Good presentation. You have what you need from us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. The next agenda item number nine, location for emergency customer service and payment services. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Greg Kelleher, Customer Operations Manager. Here with Angelique Real, Customer Service Supervisor, and we have Aaron McElroy, uh, Billing Operations Manager, on the screen. Uh, we're here to talk about um, selecting an interim site for in-person services, to get feedback on the process, and to provide you with an update on payment options that we're developing. So, as you know. In 2020, uh, the Wadi at our headquarters, which I guess would be better called uh, 500 East Fourth location, <laughs> uh, was closed due to COVID-19 precautions. And as a result, we streamlined some ways to conduct business with our customers. Over the phone, mail, secure Dropbox, sometimes appointment outside the building in person uh, when in person business required. Lobby was permanently closed to customers in 2021. And later that year, we launched the customer portal to provide some additional options for customers to conduct transactions with you. Customers may still desire an in-person visit uh, if they don't have access to technology or the internet. Um, if there's a complex billing situation that's better explained in person, um, if they would like some assistance signing up for our portal <clears throat> or using the portal. And if there's some kind of a communication issue or challenge. And then on top of that, there are several 
um, scenarios where an in person visit is currently required. Uh, when we have when we need a wet signature, uh, something notarized, identity verification, this is something like social security verifying. Uh, uh, when there's a need to exchange paperwork and it's something that's urgent, uh, time sensitive, when a customer doesn't have access to email, when they need to pay their bill in cash, or when they need to pick up a key for uh, a water station. Those are some examples. Today, we strictly limit those appointments and we do about 20 a week. If we followed the customer preferences and expanded that a bit, we would be looking at about 75, um, anticipating 75 appointments. So a potential interim location would bridge the gap be, um, until we develop some long-term plans for what we'd like our interim in-person customer presence to be two or three years. Next slide, please. Mary Ann. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mary Ann McElroy, Billing Operations Manager. Uh, as we navigate these changes to where we serve our customers, we are also looking at how we can continue to provide the billing services during this time of transition and ultimately provide a larger range of options for our customers in the future. eWeb will continue to offer cash payment options. We are working with our current payment processor to extend the opportunity for eWeb customers to pay eWeb bills in cash or via debit card at any Walmart location. We're expecting this service to be available in the coming weeks. The Walmart Bill Pay program will be new for both employees and customers. A full communication and training plan will be complemented with the launch of this program. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. The current Dropbox will remain at this property until the, an alternative in-person in site is available for customers as seen in the photos on this slide. Billing Operations continues to work closely with customer operations to evaluate best practices, security, and functionality of the existing Dropbox service with a focus on minimally disruptive transition to an alternative in-person location. It is our plan to communicate changes about Dropbox options in concert with other customer education materials about locations and in-person service offerings. Dropbox is a popular service for property management companies who prefer to drop off checks. It is eWeb's intention to offer a Dropbox option at future in-person sites. Next slide, please. As I've said before, interim location would initially serve about 75 customers per week by appointment. As we're developing other cash options, this facility would not need to handle cash. And that simplifies several things for us. Um, however, it's a good place to add a non-cash drop box, as Marianne has mentioned, and possibly a future ATM style payment kiosk. You may also consider some level of walk-in service. Just for logistics, such as safety, um, lunch breaks and unplanned absences, we would put about three to four um, customer service analysts here, plus a lead or a supervisor. And those who aren't currently serving a customer in person would be taking calls or doing other work. Next slide, please. So these are the eight criteria that staff have developed to um, consider for an in-person location for this business purpose. Um, so I'll go through each of these. Location should be near our customers, easy to find, um, on or near Main Road. We did a 2021 survey of a former lobby patrons and just to give you some idea of where they're coming from, about 36% from West Eugene, 20% from Curtis Street, Central Eugene, and I said four ones. About 18% from River Road, Santa Clara, and about 14% from South Eugene. The remaining 10% are either unspecified or upper or upper. Um, Convenience should be easy to access by car, by bus, by bike, on foot. Um, should have some convenient parking and we have the drop box there and ATM style kiosk should be available 24 seven. Security should be visible, well lit, safe to ingress and egress and in some sort of a populated area. Cost, that or below average, you know, your standard lease cost per square foot. 
on adequate space, workstations, reception area, restrooms, break room, uh, a conference room or an office where we could meet with third parties would be a plus. Uh, so, um, there's a lot of times when staff might need to meet here and, and it's, it might be more convenient to have an easier location for that. So we're looking at a minimum of 800 square feet here. So readiness, anything are available soon, minimal construction is, is what we're after. Um, flexibility, short term is desired two to three years. Um, and some flexibility in the space for changing evolving needs. Um, additional features are a plus. Um, a variety that might add value for us. Customer restrooms um, in some kind of a common area, EV chargers, uh, shops or restaurants, like maybe like stuff that customer might visit anyway. Um, our employee could go to lunch. That, that kind of thing is just that's kind of a plus. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of a proposed selection matrix that we might use here. Uh, staff will review several sites and then score the criteria from each site from zero to five. Uh, all one of, we want to meet all criteria. So something that really doesn't do well in, in one criteria, um, scoring like a zero or a one, uh, we would eliminate that site. Uh, and in this example, sites D and E consider because it failed with uh, one of the necessary criteria. Uh, furthermore, if the site didn't do well on three or more criteria, um, in this example, C and D, um, we would also not consider those because we need something that does reasonably well. In all. Uh, so in this example, we would look to consider negotiating with um, the owner of site A or site B. Uh, next slide, please. Looking at a total cost over three years, uh, around 230,000 range, uh, not including a future ATM style kiosk. Um, this cost includes construction if needed, a monthly lease, and maintenance until we see it. Next slide, please. So, to sum it up, we investigate several possible sites the criteria for each site, eliminating those who, sites that aren't really uh, all around, uh, and then look to enter into lease negotiations with a site that meets all our criteria, and then um, bring that back to the board for approval of the lease. Next slide, please. So at this point, um, like some any questions you might have and to give you get you um, get feedback on our selection process any thoughts you might have on really? yeah thank you for that um i have a question about the number of cash paying customers we have do you roughly have an idea of how many people pay in cash each month marianne do you have those numbers andy I don't have them handy, but I can uh, get the information and get back to you for sure. Yeah, I guess I'm just, is it a lot of people? Is it not a lot of people? I'm like, do you, do you have any idea of what the? Off the top of, if I just had, I don't have information in front of me, but if I had to guess, I would say um, 50 to 100. Or they fall into a couple of categories. One is um, anyone in the cannabis business, they're they're dealing in cash. So those are large, large sums of cash. And the other is customers who don't have bank accounts, don't believe in bank accounts, things like that. So it's it's a sliver of our customers, but it's fairly significant. I guess that's the thing that kind of comes to mind, like looking at some of these. I don't know if the uh, we're already doing the Walmart bill pay with the $2 convenience fee. We're already doing that. But that's a proposed thing. It's we haven't challenge. started it yet. It's currently in planning. I guess I just want to make sure when we come up with these policies, like some people pay cash because um, they might not, uh, they might be on the lower end of the economic spectrum. And I would hate for them to, like $2 convenience fee for them might be a lot. Um, I mean, you mentioned a bunch of different reasons why people might pay in cash, but I just want to make sure that we're not. Disadvantaging people more because they're 
they're cash based only. Um, and then if our in person um, options don't take cash, then if somebody who is a cash only paying customer, so they have to go to the Walmart bill pay, but then they have to come to another location to talk to somebody in person. That's where the kiosk would come in. The kiosk would cover that. I was going to say that there's there's multiple. There's a drop box. There would be a kiosk. There would be Walmart. There's a number of options, but I was going to say the 50 to 100 is about right. So it's about 50 to 100 a month. Um, I have some updated information there just to sort of keep you all timely with stuff just to offer it. So about 10 cash envelopes per day on average so far this year, and we've only had uh, less than 20 cash appointments this year to date. Okay. So I definitely get the sensitivity um, and this is an interim strategy. We got to look at all kinds of options. And so this is the beginning of a bigger conversation for sure. No, I totally understand that. And I also know that it's complex. Like there's a lot of needs you're trying to balance, but I just want to just discuss. I just want to make sure that that one doesn't get lost because I think that that $2 fee could, could be a burden for some people. We will process cash payments coming out of the Dropbox and we may send it in. We highly discourage it and we make people know that we discourage it for security. Okay jump in if I may. Um, I, I just want to understand the math and the logistics. You said 230,000 over three years. I'm kind of doing the math, three staff and a supervisor. Um, that doesn't include uh, that. Okay, okay. so and, uh, and 75 people a uh, week, five days a week, eight hours a day. That's less than two people an hour for four people. What are they going to do the rest of the day? They're going to have their Verizon laptops there. They're going to be taking phone calls. They're going to be doing that. Um, we don't have four people there proposed because we need four people for the appointments. We have four people so that they can feel safe and comfortable, so that if somebody calls in sick, we're not scrambling, um, so that they can be properly supervised. Um, so they will be doing what they would normally do um, if they weren't in in that. Okay. okay, so my math is getting me more like to 850,000 for this three three year deal if I burden it with staff. You know, average of $50,000 per person, four people, um, and then do that for three years. And I'm just wondering, it, we've been doing this for the last two years without a location. What is the drive to do this now? Certainly, I think there's two things there. The first, the first thing to address there is the 850,000. Um, this is staff that we have on staff anyway. We're not hiring new staff. It's the same FTE, and they're going to be doing the same thing they're doing now. These people are taking appointments currently at headquarters. The problem is um, headquarters is going away, and we're no longer going to have that option. So right now we have 20 customers a week who are being served at headquarters. Will won't have a place to serve them um, after headquarters is gone. So this is to replace that. The additional 55 a week is if we're really strict on the criteria that we use for those 20 customers per week to make sure that um, we minimize that that, um, that amount of customers that we're seeing that way. But um, we, we have heard customers express a desire and so we, we estimate now that we would be seeing 75 per week. And answer your question. Yeah, I just maybe just to plant the seed is if we're going to have these proposals, we're going to make this decision on headquarters, but we have a nonprofit that has a financial challenge and we say, okay, this is a, it's just a three year deal. And we said, well, we'll rent back part of this to help them financially for three years. Is that an option that you guys have considered? That we just stay there and we rent some space for customer service and help whoever this nonprofit. Hopefully, if it's a nonprofit, let's say if somebody comes in and you know we say here instead of giving two hundred thirty thousand to some private sector, we give it to this nonprofit and help them. That's definitely an option we would entertain. Okay, I mean I just want to make sure before we go out and lease the space that because we're making that decision here hopefully in the next three or four months. I just want to make sure that I don't know about timing, Frank. Sorry to throw that into the mix, but I know if we can help somebody supplement rent, um, why give it to the private sector when we can give it, if, if it helps somebody get over the hump and serve debt or, or make operating costs and we're in there uh, and it's only three years, we haven't changed anything. 
fully agree. I think we're looking at this and part of the requirement here would be flexibility on exit. For example, we want to we want to have the ability to adjust given that we don't know right now the dis the ultimate disposition of headquarters. So this is this is definitely interim is to prepare for that. But we also I think flexibility is probably one of the, the key criteria that we look at here. But yeah, ab absolutely. If that makes sense, we'll go there. Yeah, I'm sorry if that disrupts things, but I just tried to think. No, it's, it, really it's uh, consistent with our thinking. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So other thing, other question to comments, Sonia. Um, I appreciate all the different options and how we're trying to serve the community because I think that's really critical from a equity um, perspective and lens. I'm I'm curious if we through this process, if like you know the city, maybe the library, it's very close to public transportation. If there's any options there, they have. This, I think the city has. This is upstairs in the library building. I don't know if there's been any discussions there, but that's something that you know, maybe we have a partner with us on. Well, just have you know, spaces there, and then maybe we would have as many staff. Maybe we would still. I don't know. Um, thank you for that. Um, that's an interesting idea to certainly consider um, looking into that. I would say again that the staff are going to be on our payroll anyway. These are existing staff. We're not hiring new yeah. staff for that. Um, the other thing is, is going back to our criteria. Um, what we need to do is, is meet all those criteria. And one of them is is convenience. Um, so so we'll be looking into are we meeting everyone's convenience criteria? Um, an example is if you're arriving by automobile, does it work for you? Um, so I, I would leave it at that. Just just saying, um, we need to make sure we meet the criteria. And if you have any suggestions for other criteria, happy to. Sorry, you were not done. No, just one last question. Um, on the Walmart side, so will it be would is it staff that are Walmart staff taking payments then for e bill? Yes. Okay. And how does how will that training? Or is it a particular set of staff or is it like any cashier? What what does that look like? I'm just curious how that will. Sure. Happen. I can speak to that. So this would be through not the cash register service team, but the sort of like behind the counter service team that usually also offers their layaway services. Uh, the, our payment processor has a very large extensive network of other utilities and they do transunion, other types of payments. So it wouldn't be where you do your point of sale, but it would be sort of that enhanced customer service behind the counter additional services option there. Walmart is very familiar with this and has a training dialed in. It is more on the e-web side that we would want to make sure we just understand how all the payments go through and the customer experience to do the actual sort of transactions of that nature. And then just make sure that they're aware that they can only take payments. They can't. They're not answering any questions about bills and things. Like that. Yes, they would be an e-web brand ambassador, but they would not be e-web. That's true. Okay. So however we ensure that that's a good process for them and that doesn't end up reflecting badly in us. That would be awesome. But otherwise, I, I appreciate that we're spreading it out and giving people different options. So, yes. yes, and all they would need is the eWeb customer number. And so there is a certain part of all that that I think does make things a little easier. But yes, uh, definitely appreciate what you're suggesting. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate this crew leaning in to make sure that we have uh, in person customer options. It, it seems really important to me um, to make sure that we're providing that option for folks. So thank you. Um, and the only thought I have is on the, the convenience side, I guess I would echo some of the thoughts about downtown is if we're looking for um, convenience for, for people driving or taking bus, um, you know, doing bus transfers can be a pain, but if it's, you know, within a, a block or so of the bus station downtown to me that brings a lot of uh, a wider variety of people. Um, I, I know that the city is at least in some conversation about buying the, the former LLCC building, so I suspect there's capacity there. It seems like there are a number of partners right close to that block that could be helped anyway. Uh, appreciate the conversation and the work that you're doing to make sure we're providing that service.
Other questions or comments? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to respond a little bit to Mr. Brown because I recall back when I was a younger lad um, having to interact with the web uh, to, to pay my bill, you know, ride my bicycle down there because I didn't have a car to pay the bill because the next day I was going to get shut off. Right. And, and there are people in our community that are at that point where it's like, OK, I've got to go and I've got to get this money to EWEB tomorrow or they're going to put it off or I've got to go and talk to the people at EWEB to t let them know that I get paid next Monday and please don't shut it off until next Monday. And that is something that I have done in person. In the past, it was a long time ago. Thank goodness, I'm not in that position today. But I know that there are people that are out there that are in that position, and having face-to-face -face interaction is something that's very important. You know, I'm in the service industry, and I think that we also are in the service industry here. It's, and you, you know, can't do service, in my opinion, on a phone tree. Right? So. It's very important that we have it to me as a commissioner that we have an opportunity to have face to face. As far as what some of the other commissioners have talked about as uh, working in partnerships with some of our other community, uh, either the city or the county. Um, I know that one of the things you mentioned was the possibility of having a, a space that has public restrooms in it. I know that the city of Eugene has been struggling public restrooms in, in the downtown core. One, because if you just have public restrooms without staff in that same building, it becomes problematic. But if you have a public restroom that is, you know, that will have staff there to kind of keep an eye on it. Maybe partnering with the city of Eugene or Lane County, I think might be a, a good option. I know Matt mentioned the the LCC building in the city going in there. LCC is also going to be using there, so the space constraints there might be tough. But I know the public service building at, at Lane County, the city was in there before and has moved out. And so there's plenty of extra space in the Lane County Public Service Building, which is adjacent to the courthouse. So I would I would say perhaps look to them. I know that they're into short term leases because that's how they did it with the city. The city was in there for three years. It's something that could be easily maintained with them. So I would say look into these these uh, partner agencies and, and try and leverage that to the best of our ability. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Right. Um, thanks, commissioners. I, I did just want to mention that we are because of the timing that was mentioned earlier with the headquarters building, we are uh, with this particular discussion looking to respond to a present need. Um, we fully suspect that uh, or anticipate that we'll have uh, a broader discussion with the board about a downtown presence in general and what kind of services uh, we would plan to offer downtown and what kind of presence we really do want to have. Um, I think that'll inform um, some of these other things as we progress through through things um, like prepay and some of the other options that we're talking about for customer choice going forward. Um, this is an, a, in response to a timing issue and a need right now. We will reach out to partner agencies, but there's also expect that there might be a little bit broader discussion with the board about what kind of presence do we really want to have downtown um, and, and in what way and in, in what location and, and that type of thing. So more to come on this issue over over time, especially as we learn more about the disposition of the headquarters building, say X headquarters building. Other questions or comments? Do you have what you need from us? Uh, are you okay with the criteria? With the, with the Scoring criteria? Yes, sir. I'm fine with it. Uh, others? Yeah. Uh, make sure I don't have anything else. Okay. Good. I think we're good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're scheduled for a 10 minute break, so I will adjourn. We'll be back in 10 minutes, just a few minutes before. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, I'll reconvene the um, Eugene One Electric meeting. The next agenda item is number 11, potential deed restriction for the riverfront property. It says, says no, 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 no. So, no, Frank, Frank, we're going to leave this discussion. I was just going to try it, try it, try it. That was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't point anywhere else. My my apologies. Uh, That's going to cost you three votes at least. <laughs> 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 in your election. All right. Well, it's been great. <laughs> not these three votes. Three votes on, and well, in the general election. When I when I go public. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, President Brown. Um, the board was provided um, background information on this, um, including uses and non-permitted uses for the present zoning of the of the headquarters building. Uh, the purpose of this discussion was to uh, give the board an opportunity to talk about uh, this uh, amongst commissioners, whether there were additional um, items which you would choose as a board to to restrict um, going forward. The restriction um, does uh, run with the land, so this would potentially survive. Um, there are also potential um, restrictions that could be part of a purchase and sale agreement, which might be handled a little bit differently. If there's a proposal that the board sees a particular risk with that we wanted to um, provide some uh, restrictions going forward um, as to uh, the future course relative to that proposal. We could also do that. So um, this is really for the board to talk about if there's any restrictions that uh, you would want to see um, or to ensure that staff would explore going forward. If I, if I, you don't mind, I'd like to give a little background on why this is probably on the agenda is because I'm on the committee that did that and I've got some experience in selling some of these and, and things and like um, the YMCA uh, when 4J did it they have um, a criteria there's a deed restriction that says it can only be used that are where uses are compatible with 4J because they have that but there's also a reversion clause if, if the Y doesn't um, you know five years from now if it doesn't succeed it, rather than selling it to somebody else the um, it's a trick called a triggering event the, the 4J has right to buy it back. That's the same thing with kid sports. Um, the, the, you put a, a restriction on that when Peace Health sells properties, they say no uh, adult entertainment establishments, no massage parlors, no adult bookstores, things such as that. Those are above and beyond because those are permitted uses um, in zoning that allow, they're called retail uses, and there's no, there's no differentiation or delineation on that. And so I thought we might as well at least have that conversation. If that's something you want, if you want, if we sell the headquarters building this December and whoever buys it doesn't make it, we want the right to buy it back. Or we want them to sell it. I mean, they can sell it to anybody they want and it can be converted into condos or offices or some use that doesn't meet our, what we're trying to you know, focus on. And so I just want to make sure that we're aware of that, that, uh, that once we sell it, if we don't have an event or have the right to buy it back, first right of refusal or anything else. They can sell it to anybody. They can tear it down. They can convert it into million dollar condos. They can convert it into an office. They can do whatever they want with it. It's permitted in there. So A, do we want the right to buy it back? B, do we want to put any restrictions on it that says we don't want particular uses that we don't feel would be compatible with either community values or things such as that? And Sonia? I mean, I would personally think that it would be a good idea to have a restriction for first right of refusal if it goes under. I am curious, since examples include failure to complete development, inability to obtain adequate financing. If they weren't able to obtain adequate financing, wouldn't that just mean that they didn't buy it from us? Or is there another way that they could have purchased it in some way, but then it seems like that would be more of a failure to complete the development that's like tied in together. Yeah, I don't think that. I mean, we're going to we're not going to carry a contract. I don't think we can. I think we're going to get cash. Yeah, and, uh, and so then then it won't be ours. We won't have any say in it or anything else in the future. So where well, that could come in, but um, Mr. Carlson is if they they 
bought the headquarters with the purpose in mind that we really understood. Uh, they paid us, but then failed to execute on the remaining of the finance necessary. Absolutely, which is the deviation from the proposed plan, which I also agree with. I think it would be great to have a deviation from the proposed plan. Um, unsuccessful business venture, it seems like that would lead to potential first right of refusal. Um, the, the only thing on the deviation from the proposed plan is how do we measure how much deviation is too much? What does that look like? I mean, if they say, OK, I'm going to put in this art, this amazing art installation, and they put in an art installation and a music store, is that a deviation that's too much, or how does that work like? So I guess with some caveats, deviation to proposed plan, you know, it was in the community's interest to benefit this group, but now it's not doing that at all. Um, we need to, I, I just need to think about how we put some real clear side words on that. So whatever happens with it, um, it, it would be clear. Um, and then I also uh, like the idea of having a restriction um, against some of the other similar types of uh, to what 4J did. Yeah, and I think I gave staff an example of what Peace Health did when they sold um, the blood bank on 700 block of East 13th. They put re restrictions in there, no escort services, no adult, things like that. It was pretty limited to about eight or 10 restrictions. They just didn't want that on property that's in close proximity of the hospital. So they just threw that deep restriction on it. And, um, and so that was, the this board and I just thought we, we could have a discussion and people don't want that's that's okay too. So I've got your feedback and Mindy. That sounds good to me. I I I agree with what Sonia said or the question she brought up and um I think it's important to have something in place. And so you're talking about having a limited range of Use is similar to what we talked about, and you're talking about maybe having a first right of refusal. If, if they go to sell it to a third party, that's you know that we have the first right to to negotiate to buy it back. Yeah, and then the only other thing which Sonia did bring up is if they deviate from the plan. I mean, I feel like this, this board here we're, we're a pretty tight group. I can't imagine we're going to nitpick little things, but um, yeah, what, what does it mean to deviate? From Plan if it's well, you know, if I may, just yeah. to the dialogue, that's going to really be. A, I mean, because they're not going to be able to finance it if we put restrictions on that, a lender won't touch it. Uh, and, and so, we're going to have to be careful there. I mean, that's like saying how long's a piece of string until we define it very, very, we can't answer it. And so, I think we're going to have to, uh, some part of this has to be good faith. Yeah. But uh, yeah. and we have to look at the, the integrity of the people doing it. I think I know a couple of groups that are coming up, and they're they're solid people. I mean, if they say they're going to do it, they've got the horsepower to do it. And hopefully, we'll make the right decision. Uh, well, the future's hard to predict. Yeah, and I just <laughs> want to make sure how far we want to go with this. I don't want to get into telling people, well, you said you were going to do the arts, but you only did music, so therefore it's not the arts. I, you know, that's yeah. You know, uh, I I think. There, so OK, John. I'm a little hesitant. And I'm a little the reason I'm a little hesitant is, well, first off, I think that there would have to be a time, a, a time specific. I don't want an indefinite deed restriction on this piece of property. If I'm buying the, if I'm buying a piece of property with an intent to use it and I use it to that extent for 10 years, and and my needs and my changes have come across have, have changed in that 10 years. I don't want to be beholden to a elected board that was put the community's values 10 years ago on my piece of property. So I think that there needs to be some sort of a an end date to it if, if I were if I were to vote for it. Um, buying it back. Are we going to be in a position to actually say, OK, we, we will buy it back at what the question? Second question is, is at what price do we buy that back at? Do we have to pay for all the improvements that they've done? Or is it buy back at $15 million or whatever the price that we sold it to them for? It's the option. 
I know that it's it's an option, but so I mean, right of first refusal. I don't know, you know. So then Senator buys it next week, big trip, they have financial problems, every recession continues and they decide to sell it. A developer that wants to put in multi-million dollar condominiums, we want the right to uh, at least negotiate with them to buy it back before they sell it. And, and I, I, I can do that to a certain extent, maybe for the first five years, but I don't, if, if I'm stepping up to that table and I've got that deed restriction, I don't know what's going to happen in five years. It's not a restriction. It's only if they go to sell it. Right, but that's what I'm saying. I, if, I'm, if I'm in a business and I, I think my business is going to succeed and it doesn't su succeed or it doesn't go the way I want, be holding to a, a board that I don't know and, and that may not be the same board that's sitting here. I, I just have I have concerns about an open ended deed restriction. I'm just going to put that out there. Number one, right of first refusal is not a deed restriction. It's just a right if they sell it and they say they're going to sell it to. Well, no, I know, but we're talking about. Nine, we're talking nine, about we have a right to match that. I, I, I understand. I know what a right of first refusal is. I've had several of them, but we're talking about if they're not using it in the way that we're saying that is a deed restriction. Yeah, that's the one I have problems with too. And if that's the case, I definitely, you know, it's like a, a time frame on that would be something that I would have. I don't I, to have. I just don't have a problem with saying no adult bookstores, no escort services, no massage parlors. If we want to say that, that's forever. No Italian restaurants. I'm not putting those in the same category. <laughs> he just did a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> No real, no real estate offices. <laughs> no, uh, you know. Yeah, I know. I, I, I get it. So I, I understand your concerns. So I know that's that's a good discussion. Matt, you got it. Yeah, it, it's actually pretty clear to me. I have no interest in need restrictions. I think um, I just don't. I don't want us to get into that level of detail. But okay. I do think um, the first right of refusal for the first ten years is a good idea. Okay, so we got kind of difference of opinions. I have. No deed restrictions, but first right of refusal for 10 years. I've got deed restrictions on uses. And I, I kind of, you know, like I said, I don't want somebody to go in there, but that's something that I don't think will ever be acceptable in the community for community values, but that's my personal thing. But With the deed restrictions though, like are the things, there's already things that are not allowed there, right? Mm -hmm. So. Industrial usage, like mortuary. You can put any kind of bookstore you want there. Any kind of bookstore you want there. First Amendment. Unless it's restricted <laughs> privately, it's a First Amendment crime. Whatever would be allowed in retail or burning. Yeah, and that's there's, what there's retail. You can't have a pot shop within a thousand feet, but, but that's restricted. You can have one, but you can't have another one within a thousand feet of that one. I think it was some zoning says, but I don't want to, you know, Matt's got a good point. I don't want to get too far into the weeds either. So I would lean towards 10 years first try of refusal and let her go. It doesn't mean we have to buy it, it just means we have the right. Uh, to no, no, no. I, and I, and I, I'm, I'm fine with that. The, 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 you know, for the deed restrictions for what some of you community value uses. This is gonna, probably going to be one of the highest square footage, cost per square foot buildings around. I would imagine if you're leasing it out. I don't think that those types of businesses are going to want to pay the. the you know, there, there's. You're saying that this is a community value property. Want it to attract. Yeah, and and I don't and I don't think that would dissuade anybody from. I don't think those uses would dissuade somebody from doing it. It's just in the interest of finding consensus. Let's kind of pull the group. So I'll start. I, I would I would say, OK, I'll give up on the deed. I, the deed restrictions, fine. Let it take its course. But a 10 year first right of refusal if they sell it to a third party. It would be what I, my proposal. Matt? Yeah. You good with that, Mindy? I, I would be okay with that. 
John? Explain what that cost would be. Cost. So, so for first right of refusal. Somebody goes in, buys it for 15 million, and puts 20 million dollars into it. Puts it up for sale for 40 million dollars. We get that first right of refusal. No, we 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 get to match any offer. Right. Oh, we get to match any offer. Okay. Yeah, it's not what they at what they want. It's what it could, if Nike comes in and says, I'll give you 40 million, we can buy it for 40 million. It's only good for 30 days because it, it really effectively takes it off the market. It, it's not a good thing. And buyer may push back on it and we'll have to give up on it, but we, can, we can't get what we don't ask for. I've tried to get that in leases and had people. It's, yeah, it's challenging you know, because you know, who's going to want to make an offer on something that somebody else has the right to buy? So then I guess my question would be is, how how wedded are we to this that if if we put this into a, into a a contract and somebody walks away over this we're not going to let them walk away over it we'll give up and well that that needs to be that needs to be put out there that this is something that well, is that it's useless Sorry. that is negotiable right because if we can ask for it we can ask for it and if they if they push back to a deal killer then we we drop it Okay. Well, that that's not what you put out there. You said a, a, a restriction, a deed restriction of a, of a right of first refusal for 10 years is what you proposed to us. That's different than a, asking for a, asking for that in a purchase and sale agreement. Fine, this is why we're having the discussion. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I, I would think that. Um, when we get to the point where we're evaluating proposals, it sounds like from what, what you described and what you moderated or mitigated here, uh, President Brown, that adding further deed restrictions doesn't seem like the board has an appetite for that because there are uh, you know, permitted uses and unpermitted uses presently as, as sort of governed by the city. There are a couple of situations where I could see some type of triggering event that would give us the option to 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 claw this back in a right of first refusal. One would be um, sort of I'll call it a flipping situation. Um, the other one be, would be what I would describe as some kind of substantial failure to perform whatever whatever that and it's not a difference between art and music. It's some sort of you know there was an intent that we feel was substantial enough that that we were sort of deceived, here's your proposal and here's a different direction here. Both of those situations, um, we could approach the purchase and sale agreement contractually around if, if these sort of triggering events happen, here's going to be our response to that. And it could be a right of first refusal matching an offer. It could be a right of first refusal at a, a price that we set, and it could be the, the price that we sell. I mean, those are those are options that we will have at, at the time. But what I am hearing is an appetite from the board to incorporate into a contract that you want whoever buys this to fulfill the intent behind their proposal. And if there's a triggering event of a couple times, that we will we will negotiate that into a contract to the best of our ability. That's that's kind of what I'm hearing. Julia. Interesting, because I just heard that they didn't want any deed restrictions at all other than the right of first refusal. So if they bait and switch us, hey, we're going to give you all these wonderful things. We'll give you this low price. They flip it and then turn around and sell it for $40 million. And we just lost all of that money out for our customers, our ratepayers, thinking we were going to get some community benefit that never transpired. I'm going to be livid. Livid. So. That's why I want a deed restriction. I want to make sure that there is something there. There's some sort of way that we can claw back. This is supposed to be that for the community benefit. Whatever comes out of it, if we're taking less money to get more community benefit, I want them to follow through with that. Look, can I say that that would be a negotiation? If, if we think the threshold is just say $1,200 and we decide to accept eight, because of the community values thing, and then they want to flip it because it's really worth 12. I get it. And I don't know if we can protect ourselves against that. Uh, I mean, we can 
we can negotiate that in. I mean, when we're negotiating, we say, look, you know, should be paying 12, but we're going to give it to you eight, but we're going to throw on a first right of refusal or, or reversion clause if you don't fulfill your, your goals within the next five or 10 years. So then somebody comes and buys it from them at 12, mm -hmm. and we are now paying them 12, and we just lost $4 million for our repairs. Okay, you got to look at the intent of who's buying it. If yeah. it's if it's a public sector that buys it or a nonprofit, they're not buying it to make money. But if it's private sector, you buy real estate to make money. So that you know it's implicit. You pay eight million, you want to flip it for twelve. I mean that's the way. Well, I'm not anti the business side of it necessarily, but if we give a benefit or you know we had all of this work around making this criteria boring for community benefit. If that doesn't transpire and we give some other amount, then that just doesn't quite seem. Maybe I could offer a compromise solution that now that we've had the discussion and we all understand the concept that when we get to evaluating them, we look at that and we know that that's a tool at, at our disposal, but we don't have to mandate it. That's not acceptable to others. That, that, if, that if we have a, a minimum threshold and we decide to take less than that, because of it meets some community value goals and we say, okay, if you're going to do this, we want to make sure you have, you're going to do it and we have something to keep their feet to the fire to do it. That's a negotiation thing, but it's not mandated. I get, I get your point. I feel better doing that because right now we're just talking in hypotheticals and we yeah. don't know what right. who it is that's putting in proposals or what we're even leaning towards. And so um, I think it's good to have this discussion to kind of bring up these issues and just know that this is a, this could be a bargaining thing for us. And just let it go by the wayside. No deed restriction, no reversion clause, but we know we have those tools at our at our disposal when we get into fund. Does that sound acceptable to others? Does that sound like we're done? Yes, it, it sounds fine. I think there, when we get into that discussion, we can talk about the mechanics of this, whether it's part of a contract or whether there are certain things we get regarding flipping that you could put as a deed restriction with a, with a timeline, for example. So once we get to that point, and I agree with the hypothetical comment, um, we can explore not only what restrictions and how, but we can also the mechanics of how we that's okay. that's fair. Are we good with that? All right. We'll move on. Thank you very much. All right. Number 10, 12, quarterly operational strategic goals for Q2. Thank you, President Brown. Good evening, commissioners. Um, really, as a routine part of your board packet, uh, now you did receive staff's quarterly operational and strategic update. So go ahead with the next slide, please. Um, you know, expecting that we were uh, potentially uh, stressed with time, I, I tried to be brief uh, in the presentation, thought I'd run through a few high level results. Um, first of all, you know, 10 of the 14 goals so far this year are on track. Um, and those that are not or are making progress, uh, they're just not specifically where we wanted to be uh, at the mid year. Uh, halfway point. You know, one example uh, is the permitting for the Willamette treatment plant. We we made a lot of progress there. We're just not quite where we wanted to be uh, at this point uh, in time, but we are making progress on on all 14. Um, we did, you know, additionally a number of items that we made progress on, and the and the board has helped us with things like wildfire mitigation plans. Lieberg analysis, um, despite the uncertainties that we bring forward, uh, continues to, to progress. Uh, integrated resource planning, all of these things are progressing and feel like the organization um, is continuing to move forward on a lot of these items. So um, we have also, you know, we've transitioned uh, as an organization from being in responsive mode uh, related to COVID protocols to more of a proactive, intentional, dynamic workforce model. Uh, presently, you know, 14% of our workforce is telecommuting. 40% uh, is in a hybrid mode and 46% are facility based. Um, a lot of that is driven by the specific work and what the work allows uh, employees to do. Uh, but we also have recognized the 
uh, the benefits uh, of providing and looking at those kinds of options relative to how people interact with the team and their work groups and and the equipment and the work that they do. And so or we feel like we're much more in a proactive mode than we were um, in COVID where we were really responding and reacting. So I feel like that um, continues to to progress. Um, supply chain issues. Um, have to give a lot of credit to different parts of the organization for uh, their creativity, for their ability to respond. Um, we are looking at a number of different scheduling uh, of priorities. Um, some shift from uh, work that is more material intensive, such as some capital work to more O&M work in some cases. Um, that varies a little bit between water and electric. Um, we are seeing some capital projects and our capital spending so far this year is off compared to, to where we wanted to be from a budgetary perspective and, and much of that is because of the, the supply chain issues. Um, but we also have to admit that we are uh, um, facing some uh, delays uh, in the impending, impending customer facing work, building and renovation work. Uh, this is something we've done a lot of outreach and communications on, but the, the reality of it is when you have uh, limited equipment, you have to prepare for uh, emergencies, for response, for some of these things, and you have to prioritize that. So we're we're in the middle of that, but really feel like staff has, has done a good job of looking at how we do our work, how we prioritize things as well. Uh, some of the customer facing programs, a couple here just of note, and I wanted to mention this uh, specifically because some custom some commissioners have mentioned it in the past um, regarding commercial energy efficiency work uh, you'll notice that so far uh, from a megawatt hour saved we're at 50 percent 57 percent of our target but only 36 percent of our budget and part of the reason there is more bang for the buck when you look at commercial and industrial opportunities um, 80 percent of our results so far this year are from the commercial industrial side and so um, you know rather than aggregate a whole lot of little projects um, so far this year we've concentrated on some of the larger ones and you can kind of see the result here uh, the am amount of megawatt hours saved per dollar is, is pretty is, is higher than our than our budgetary projection which is which is a mix of those two uh, and then uh, as some of you know the e-bike rebates have been uh, so far so far very popular this this year green options is has been launched up to a little bit of a slow start in other areas, but e, you know things like e-bikes are, are popular um, way past what other utilities have seen in their results so far. It could be a reflection of our community, um, but it is something that uh, we're excited about and it's a great touch point for the community uh, and some of the work we do and, and how we uh, spend some of the funds that we get uh, from the state for clean energy uh, fuel credits, um, clean energy fuel credits. So appreciate the work that's going on in that arena. Uh, next slide, please. Just there's a, a couple of slides here that give you a snapshot of the status of each of our sub goals uh, so far this year. Um, just to kind of reiterate, we think we're making making progress on those. I'll go ahead with the next slide as well. Uh, and so um, you can see we are uh, in process with a lot of these. Uh, I'll, I would say that the commissioners are, are familiar with with these because you've been participating and we really do appreciate your guidance and, and time. Uh, we have asked a lot of commissioners so far this year and we know that we're entering a fall season. Um, really the remainder of this year you have some pretty substantial uh, guidance to provide and decisions to make uh, for the utility. And we appreciate the dedication that you all have. And so uh, go ahead with the next slide. And so with that, commissioners, uh, we are halfway through 2022, as amazing as that sounds, um, and feel like we're making good progress. Uh, we're uncovering and addressing issues, uh, challenges that come our way. You know, I would like to, to thank you again for your oversight uh, and really thank staff uh, who really on a day in and day out basis uh, serve our community and uh, who are also uh, helping us position the utility uh, for the future. 
And so with that, uh, we're definitely open to observations and questions and comments. Back to you, Mr. President. I'll open it up. Questions? Um, I got just one quick one. And this may, John or Frank can probably answer. Um, as far as the land use applications for the second treatment plan, the PS, the public facility services plan. Yeah. Um, is that got, Greenfield is going to be the initiator of that, or are you going to have Lake County initiate that? And what's the status of that going yeah. as of right now? I know, I mean, I know how it goes once it's initiated, but we got to get somebody to kick it, kick the can. I will follow up to see who the actual initiator is going to be. I know that uh, the city of Eugene and Springfield, I, I believe the dialogue was started uh, between the city, the city of Springfield got with the city of Eugene. Um, those two organizations are working with eWeb and others, so it really is a mutual effort at this point to open up that that plan for revision. But I, I don't know off the top of my head who would be the official initiator at this point, but I can, I can find out. And I, again, uh, just for somebody who's worked on those in the past, that can be a drawn out affair and it's appealable. And, and if we can get that going, sooner the better obviously I, I mean you know we're, we can't initiate it right. but we can not let grass grow under the feet of the people who who need to because it's just getting the process started originally i had heard that we were we being those parties was looking at we're looking at later this year to initiate that but i, I would need to confirm that okay. and and the only reason i bring that up is because we, we let 10 years go by and it cost us another what 20 million dollars so i mean yeah and, and i mean a a land use a, a change to the metro plan with appeals could be two or three years to get that done yeah we're also simultaneously uh, commissioner borowski working um with the city of springfield and with within their development process so there's there's permitting there's changes to the glenwood refinement plan there's a number of of things rel relative term permits and land use on the city of springfield side as well so uh, we have opened up a dialogue with with them we met with their city council that that went well and we're working with city staff to try to schedule a um, a development issues meeting which is a prerequisite to a number of, of their processes so see a couple of different and that was one that was in yellow and part of the reason in yellow was the, the progress of all these simultaneous things although there's been really good progress uh, specifically relative to city of springfield leadership um, but we we understand that there's more work to be done there so if it if it would be possible to just send out a memo as to the the progress how that that progress is going on yeah. if, if you don't mind i can put it in the gm report um and if maybe not sooner when we have our one-on-ones i can provide an update next week Perfect. thank you other questions or comment mindy yeah um the comment wow we're busy <laughs> that's a lot in there i feel like this is the my fourth year on the board and this is by far the busiest a lot going on um and i have a question about the um the customer facing programs the energy efficiency and if you say that we're 50 percent of target do we have like a target number of projects and tar like what is that target so the target is uh, megawatt hours saved um and that's based on um, a projection for what the first year of savings would be um so and we typically right now it's been around uh, 10,000 megawatt hours is what our annual target is for savings. Um, so it's a megawatt hour savings um, and that number comes from the original IR, say original, the last IRP officially from 2011, which said we were going to offset load growth through conservation. That's what developed that target. And is it just happenstance that we have more commercial customers taking advantage of that right now, or do we have a concerted effort? To... Uh, it's just the timing of, of some large commercial projects that are that are coming forward. We try to keep a good balance and make something available to everyone. 
And right now, this year, we're just really strong on commercial projects. Other questions or comments? None. Thank you, Frank. Next agenda yeah. item is yours. Board of uh, Correspondence and Board Agenda. Thank you, President Brown. I'll get to my notes here. So there was um, one item on correspondence, and that was some information uh, for the board on uh, customer service policy, SD3. Um, we do have um, a little more in-depth discussion coming up. Um, that was really a preview. If you had any uh, initial responses or guidance, be happy to hear it this evening. The other thing we could do is, is talk about that during check-ins. That's another option, but we are bringing some information back to the board next month to talk about that specifically and any changes that, that you've made with that. So this was a guidance item and it was, it was there to give you uh, a preview of coming attractions. Uh, so if there were any comments now, I'd be happy to hear those. We're good. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. And then the, the, the board agenda report um, is also attached. Um, you'll see some upcoming things. Uh, really looking forward to giving the board some feedback on our uh, customer survey next month. Um, I think that's, that's going to provide some interesting insight. Um, like I said, the second half of this year is incredibly busy for you. And so thank you in it, or my condolences in advance. I'm not sure which of those, uh, probably both, but um, appreciate, appreciate that and answering questions you might have. Questions? Sonia? Uh, I was just looking at the December because I know that that's always a gigantic board packet. And I noticed that the, uh, the state legislative agenda policy is always in December, which is interesting to me because there are things that we would like Jason to work on when he's up in Salem. We have to submit, I think they have to submit, like they have to work with other legislators to get drafts in prior to that board meeting. I don't know if there's, I mean, if there are big things, maybe there's not, but it does seem like it would be somewhat better from a process perspective in general to have some of that conversation earlier so that he can work with those legislators prior to that date. There is something else that comes out of the board. I know a lot of it is typically, J you know, driven by Jason and what he's seeing up there and, um, you know, the landscape, which is fine. And I get that. But if we do want to be proactive and there are things that we think that we would like to state, it's too late at that point. Are you saying prior to the December meeting? Okay. Any other questions or comments regarding? I'll work with you. I know we have an update next month, the legislative agenda up for, for September, but the setting the agenda for the next year in December, we'll, we all, maybe you and I can talk further about what that might look like to move some things up to facilitate that a little bit further. Yeah, if, if others you know, want that capability, just next. Excuse me. Um, just a question on the agendas. I know that we have a placeholder for for August 16th work session. Are we having a work session then? Um, no, we will not. We'll, we'll give you a couple weeks off. <laughs> John, you mentioned the second half of the year is going to be busy. Is that alluding that the first half of the year wasn't busy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have busier. I, I have no comment on that. <laughs> Yeah, I think when we dig into labor at Walterville, we're going to be busy. Thanks. Others, so. Other questions or comments on uh, correspondence board agendas? If not, then we'll head to uh, board wrap up. Mindy. Good. John B. Too. Um, I just I would just like to say thank you to the staff that put together all of this work. You know, we're busy, but. For every hour that we're here, it's probably 20 hours that staff is is working on on these board agendas. So I just want to definitely give my uh, shout outs to them. Uh, looking forward to dinner next week. Uh, we really don't have a agenda set for that, but it's just kind of last one worked out very well. So I'm looking forward to that and the work 
that's going to be upcoming. Oh, yeah. Hey, sir. Um, I, I'd like to do a couple things. Just for the record, I'm, December I'm going to be remote. Um, I'm going to go on vacation and I can't, couldn't get logistics aligned, but hopefully the internet has improved where I'm going. And so I'll be able to do that. If not, I've got a, a really good first, but I know there's some big decisions. That, I mean, Lieberg's final may be there, so I will participate no matter what. It's just how I, I'm going to try and do it this way. So um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to uh, just reiterate my staunch uh, concern about water quality, both in the Mackenzie and the Willamette, and hopefully stay on that because you know uh, my passion. And uh, I just don't want the water quality to get degraded any longer. So thank you. And I'd like to say to everybody else, I really appreciate the dialogue. I've been doing this for a while. The dialogue we have challenging each other and having this back and forth, like like many said, is have to, to have these discussions rather than us and staff, but amongst each other. I think we push each other and we challenge each other and it's done in a respectful manner. Thank you very much because I think we get the better decisions doing that. And so I think it to me it's working well. And so I, I would just like to say thank you very much and don't ever hesitate to, to speak up. I don't like it, you know, or, or we should do this. I think we're getting the best results and you're right, we're busy and I think we're going to be busier. So um, with that, is there anything else that we need for the good of the order? Sorry, it's about 10 o'clock, but I'm going to keep it. I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.